a new kind of adventure began in Canada. At Bedeck, Nova Scotia, J.A.D. McCurdy lifted off the ice a strange, clumsy flying machine in what became the first powered flight over Canadian soil. It was a flight that set a course for bold Canadians to follow. Within eight short years, Canadians were fighting in the air battles of the First World War with Sopwiths, Avros, Newports, and Spads. In the 21 years of peace that followed, they started to push back the frontiers of Canada to fly men and machinery and food into the northern wilderness, only to take up arms once again in Hitler's war. The after years of uneasy peace have led to still greater achievement, for it was not enough that Canadians should fly. The need came for them to design and build their own planes. Working planes and freighting planes for the specialized needs of Canadian expansion and fighting aircraft for the specific problem of Canadian defense. For decades, the magnet for Canadian skills and imagination had tugged at us from outside our borders. Suddenly, the flow was reversed. Our goal became inflow, and from many lands, aerial designers, flight scientists, and technicians started to converge on Canada to join and meet a great challenge. Many of these honed in on a few hundred acres here at Malton, northwest of Toronto, where a new frontier was beckoning and an old name, Avro, was coming into new prominence. Here was burgeoning a new center of creation and imagination. And from this center has emerged 50 years after McCurdy's first flight, and within that one man's lifetime, a new excitement in Canadian skies. The first, Arrow in the Sky. Six years ago, Avro and the RCAF looked into the future toward the needs of today. Based on Air Force requirements, Avro completed a proposal for an armed interceptor aircraft for supersonic defense and in 1953 presented it to the government. It was accepted and a great work began. The Arrow was to be no handmade prototype. When the first machine came off the line, others were to be right behind it in advancing stages of production. After the drawings came the scale models. Into the wind tunnel they went for observations of performance at high speeds and low. They were spun to check their recovery characteristics. Because the problems were new and complex, no one could predict the behavior of all surfaces at supersonic speeds. So a scale model was tested for flutter, with all results recorded and assessed. With the first arrow off the line to be a production model, every last detail had to be checked. Here is a wooden cockpit mock-up mounted on a truck moving about the field at taxiing level. See those reflections? Distracting to the pilot. Now was the time to correct them. They had been eliminated when the first arrow, aircraft number 25201, came off the line. And how about getting out of the arrow in an emergency? Shoot him out, seat and all. Because at supersonic speeds, a man is imprisoned by speed and air pressure. But first, try it on the dummy. This is the test rig of the air conditioning. The two-man crew, the pilot and radar observer, must be kept cool even when the outside air is 50 below. At a speed of 1,200 miles an hour, a temperature of 300 degrees will build up on the arrow skin just from the friction of the air. And here is a complete model of the arrow's complex electrical system to check its operation before installation in the finished aircraft. To give even a faint idea of the months of testing before production began on the Arrow, it would take hours of film, so we can only touch on the highlights. Here, for instance, is the way engineers could foretell how the Arrow would actually behave in flight. Several models were made, each one-eighth the size of the finished aircraft, and into them was installed electronic equipment, which would transmit to ground observers the needed information. 
To put these reduced size models into flight, they were attached to Nike rockets and shot out high into the air over Lake Ontario. In their short flying life, the instruments they carried sent back to ground a continuous stream of information, while special cameras and radar tracked them as they flew. On to the plotting board went all this data for analysis by design engineers. By no means all the work on the Arrow was confined to Malton. A large network of subcontractors and suppliers all over Canada contributed to its construction, emphasizing the fact that the project has been a cooperative effort involving the resources of the whole of Canada. Not only have nearly 10,000 workers at Malton been kept in full employment during these years of achievement, but many other thousands in over 600 individual specializing plants. But the day must come when calculation, ground testing, and manufacture must be proven in flight. This is the man who will take the first arrow into the sky, Jan Zurakovsky. 10,000 employees swarm to the margins of the field to watch the product of their hands and brains at this climax to the years of creation. It's now March 25th, 1958 the morning when the arrow will shoot up into its natural element. Tape recorders are rolling. Instruments of all kinds are ready to record every word and signal transmitted. The two chase planes take off in escort. Their pilots will observe the arrow in flight at close range and talk back and forth, as you will shortly hear. Arrow 201, Tower for takeoff 32. And now, it begins. Photograph it. The elevator is about 
about three degrees or four degrees up as far as I can see from here. Ailerons are nice and fresh. Controls here seem to be quite normal and no problem. Wind is 40 to 50 degrees, 10 to 15 vertical. So 201, Toronto Tower, two to land, wheels down, lock 32. He's cut down. Wonderful parachute, you are fine. Zero one down to twenty seven, clear two company. are realized, the theories are proved. From now on, the Avro Arrow becomes a reality, a flying fact. And to those thousands who have helped to design and build the Arrow, one thing is clear. They have put into the air one of the great aircraft of all time. Closely, they watch its performance. On its third flight, it streaks through the air faster than sound. On its seventh, the arrow far exceeds 1,000 miles an hour while climbing, not diving or in level flight. And this with interim American engines. With its Canadian Iroquois engine, the arrow's performance will be greatly improved. The Iroquois is another great Canadian technical achievement. Research. Design. Development, production, a Canadian team brought together, held together by the challenge of achievement. The arrow is dramatic evidence of the progress made in Canada in 50 years of powered flight. Since the first flight by McCurdy 50 years ago, Canadians have taken to the air as if it were their natural element. Like an armorer forging tempered swords for 20th century men-at-arms, Canadians are producing the world's most advanced manned interceptors. Here they are. 25201, the first arrow to fly. Then 202. 203. 204, all these now in the air, with a growing pool of trained Arrow pilots to fly them. Here is Arrow 205, now going through experimental flight tests. And 206. This is the first Arrow to be powered by the Canadian-built Iroquois engines and it may well smash the world's speed record for production aircraft. That will be a day of triumph for all Canada, for all Canada will have shared in this great endeavor. In 1959, Avro salutes the 50th anniversary of powered flight in Canada as this supersonic sentinel of the stratosphere speeds to the new wide frontiers of guardianship. Canada's arrow in the sky.